let's talk about analysis with Cardo. Analysis is a way to do common GIS operations with Cardo without using a desktop GIS. This can be nice for, for relatively straightforward things. Um, so I have a couple of layers here on my map and I want to show you a few types of analysis that you might find useful. So um, let's start with just the education for now. And I'm going to look at this and I'm going to open up the data to see what's available in here. Um, so this is education data. It's from a project called Map Cabrera at mapcabrera.org. Um, and these are education features in the area known as Cabrera outside of Nairobi, Kenya. Um, so the first thing I want to show is how you might filter by the type of education here. So let's say we just want to see primary schools in this data set. How would we do that? So we go to the analysis tab under the layer right here. And you see that we don't have any analysis yet. We can add some. And from here, there are a bunch of different features we can use that will analyze or modify our data in a variety of ways. Right now, because I'm just filtering by the value in one of the columns, I'm going to pick filter by vo column value. And all of your settings for each type of analysis are going to happen over here on the left. So right now it's saying select a column. So I'm going to pick the column. I believe it was type. And then it will ask me for uh, what to match on. So I'm going to scroll down to primary and hit apply. So it lets me the, know that row filtering has finished. I'm just going to say, never show me this again, and hit done. And you see there are far fewer features. If I go back to the data view, we can look through here, and we see that all of the types are now primary. So now we just have primary. OK. So we could leave it like that. And you can see right here, now it's no longer just the layer, but it also has this filtering operation here. And we can go back to it by clicking on it here. And you can see um, you can see the details and change those again here if you want to. So let's say I want to find um, just the what san the water and sanitation features that are near a primary school. That's a pretty common GIS operation, and it'll be a couple more steps. So on top of our filtering, we're going to add a buffer, say maybe 150 meters as a short walking distance, and then we will find just the what san features within the, that buffer. So um, we can, there are two ways to add another analysis. The one I showed you before was click on the layer name and then the analysis tab. And then we could hit plus to add another layer of analysis here. Or if we go back out to the map panel, we can click add analysis here. And that's the same thing. And buffering, as we know it in GIS, falls under this areas of influence analysis. So we'll click that. And as before, all of the options are over here on the left. I'm going to leave it meters, but you could do kilometers and miles. I'm going to bump the radius up to 150. And I'm going to leave everything else intact right now and hit apply. And you see that all of the features that were filtered on the education layer now have this buffer around them of 150 meters. If we decided we wanted that to be smaller,
we could change it here and hit apply and you'll see that the circles get a bit smaller the buffers get a bit smaller okay so now if we want to find just the watt sand features that are within one of these buffers we can add some analysis to the watt sand later and um, we're going to want to do an intersect second layer here Just double checking. Right? So we pick our intersect layer. Now this part's a little bit tricky because we have, you can see that the education layer shows up multiple times here. So it shows up once for the source, once for the filtering that we did, and once for the areas of interest or the buffers. Um, what we want is to see if we want to see which watt sand features are within the buffers, so we want to pick the buffer layer. And you can aggregate um, within the buffers how, or actually this is going to aggregate onto the points, so how many schools are each watt sand feature next to? That's fine for now. We'll hit apply. Cool. So you can see now that we only see the watt sand features that are within 150 feet of a school, right? So you can see here, um, it's a little confusing at first, but what it's showing you is layer A is education. A1 and A2 are the analyses on top of that. And layer B is the Watson, and you see that it has a B1 on it, and one of the other layers involved in that is A2, which is the buffers over here. Okay, so let's say maybe I want to show the schools also that I have filtered here. Um, one really handy way to do this is just to click and drag on one of these analyses. So maybe I just want to show the filtered education points. I can click here and drag it up. And we should see points for these. We do, but they're a little hard to tell from the lot sand features. So I'm going to go ahead and style that. And once I do, you'll see that or you should see, there it goes, um, that when you click and drag on some analysis, it actually creates another layer. Um, <clears throat> and it's this C layer, but these are related now. So um, I can also, I could just hide this buffer, and it still has the same effect on the watt sand. You see that we still only see the watt sand features nearby these primary schools. Or if I wanted to, I could style it independently. Maybe I make it extra transparent. Just give a, leave a hint that there is some buffering happening. maybe. Get rid of the stroke. We'll give that a second. Okay. Or maybe actually we don't want to see the individual circles. If you're familiar with, um, with making buffers in GIS, you know that you can dissolve buffers so they become one large feature. And um, so we can do that right here by clicking dissolve and apply. And then it, we should just have one feature that is the collection of all of those buffers. Although, okay, that was taking a second to update.
Okay, so that took a few seconds to load for some reason, but as you can see now, the overlap is no longer there. So if I make the fill transparent, you'll see that the um, buffers no longer intersect with each other. So yeah, so we just get one feature that is the outline of 150 meters from each school. And one of the fun parts about analyses is if you change them in one place and they're used in others, uh, they will affect the other um, places where they're used. So for example, the you can see the A2 also exists up here when we're filtering the Watsan features. So when we change A2, that's going to affect this filter also. What's that mean? So if I go back, if I click on A2, I can make the radius larger. Let's make it 200. And you'll see that the Watsan features that show up, there will be more because the buffers will be bigger, right? you can see much more are included. And if we take it back down to 100 or so, you'll see much fewer Watson features. Okay. And again, this is taking a couple of seconds to load. There it goes. Okay, so that's a simple buffer and filter, um, filtering actually on both layers. And remember that um, copying these analyses out and reusing them is as easy as clicking and dragging. And we'll have another layer of the Watsan there, as you can see. So I want to do one more thing with analysis to give you an idea of how analysis might be useful. And I'm going to do that with the um, earthquake data that the USGS releases. So I'm creating a new map with earthquakes data. Um, so what I want to do is create clusters of these earthquakes to try to find natural spatial groupings of this data. So the way I'm going to do that is click Add Analysis here. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom to calculate clusters of points. So I'm going to, let's create five clusters for now and see what happens. When I hit apply, it looks like it didn't do anything. And that's because it adds a column to the data. And you can most easily see this by clicking on the data view and scrolling all the way over to the right. And you see that we did not have a cluster number, cluster no up here. Um, so this is a number between zero and four for the five different clusters that it found. And the easiest way to actually see the result of this would be to go to the styling and style it by value and use cluster number. Because this is not a, I don't want to do a graduated style here, I want to do a categorized style. I'm going to click on quantiles there, scroll down the category. That way it's a categorized view. And so what's this showing us? It's showing us that um, using some using an algorithm, the <clears throat> Cardo has determined that this is one cluster of the earthquakes, and this around South America is another cluster, and this in the Northwest in Alaska is another cluster. Um, <clears throat> so that's one way of visualizing a cluster. You might also want to make a convex hull around each cluster to see kind of the area that each one covers. Um, 
So I might go back to analysis and click the plus sign. And there is a group points into polygons. So there are a couple of different ways to group points into polygons. I'm going to use the simpler one, convex hull, but you can see that there are a couple more. And I'm going to group by the category number, or the cluster number rather. And when it does that, it's going to find the count of um, earthquakes within it. If we wanted to do other things, like find the average magnitude of those, we could totally do that. But for now, I'm just finding the count. And this is going to take a couple of seconds. As you see, it asks us, um, it lets us know that um, these two fields are going to be in our data set. I'm going to say never show me this again. I trust it. Um, if I was curious about this, I could click on the table view and we could see, okay, there's CardoDB ID, which is just the ID of the feature, the category number, which is the same as the categories we had for the points, um, the shape, and the number of earthquakes in each category. So I can come back here, and you can see that those earthquake clusters now have shapes associated with them. So you can easily see okay, this area had zero earthquakes. You can see the smaller areas that were deemed to be clusters. And let's say, oh, I wanted actually to be able to see the earthquakes as well as the convex holes. As I said earlier, it's as easy as clicking here and dragging it. And we should see the points as before. So now we can see both the points and the convex holes associated with them. Okay, one last thing. Um, maybe you don't want just the convex hole, but you also want to see where the center of that convex hole was. We can add another analysis here to find the center points of geometries, find the centroids. Okay, so say we don't just want the shapes of these convex holes, but we also want to see where the centers of those convex holes are to get an idea of like where the, um, where the focal point is of these clusters. Uh, the, easiest way to do this is to add another analysis and find centroid of geometries. When we do that, we want to categorize by, uh, not by count valves, but by the CardoDB ID. So that's going to be the ID of each polygon. So each convex hull polygon will get its own centroid. And when we do that, we should get points at the center of each of those convex holes, but I want to see both at the same time, right? So what I'll do is pull this convex hole out. I'll drag it down so it's underneath, because I want to see all of it at once, right? And maybe I want to style this convex hole so it's not quite as prominent. I just want it to be in the background, like my buffers before and maybe I want to style the centroids so that they match that convex hull a bit. So I'll make those blue also. All right, so you can see um, you can see our categorized earthquakes, you can see our convex holes, you can see where the centers of those convex holes are. Great. And now, as I mentioned earlier, but I just want to demonstrate this again, you can change this clustering and it's going to change everywhere else where it's used. 
So if we change the clustering in one place to say allow for more clusters, it's going to update the styling, the shapes of the convex holes, and also the centroids of the convex holes. So let, why don't we do that now? So I'm going to click on that convex hole. I'm going to make eight, eight, eight clusters. All right. And when I hit apply, you should see that is indeed the case, except it does seem that the styles did not update. That's slightly weird. But you can see that the clusters and the centroids did. Why don't we look into the styling? Um, there it goes. For some reason, it did not register until we uh, clicked on it again. But as you can see, the clusters now have their own styles, and you can see the convex holes of those and the centroids of them. OK, so I'm about done with this with looking at analyses. One thing I might want to point out is you might want to rename these as you work on them, just to make it a little bit more clear what's going on. So I might call this one centroids, clusters, and convex hulls. just to make my life a little bit easier as I further work on this map. Okay, so I hope that analysis now makes a little bit more sense in Cardo, and hope that was useful.